Good evening, everyone. It gives me enormous pleasure to welcome you all to this annual lecture of the Janki Foundation. I do apologize for the delay in starting, but there were exchanges which were absolutely timely and they had to take place before we could begin. And I think the effect of that may permeate the proceedings this evening. You all know about Janki Foundation, I trust. And you all know Daddy Janki, who's given her name, uh, not just as a blessing, but as a, an enormous capital to the foundation for its success. Janki name itself is magical and really full of power. Translated simply, it means the key to not just life, but a powerful life, successful life. And as you all know her, anything she touches turns from dust to gold. And from the time she's met David, I know he has turned into something very special. And to measure his stature, and to measure his worth, you would have to weigh him, not just gold, but diamonds, because he's sitting in Diamond House. So you will have to empty your coffers so that we can weigh him this evening. David Rosen, like me, is a colonial product. We were born very close in time, very close in the British territories south of Sahara, me in Nairobi, David in Salisbury. And his grandfather went from Russia, came to England, didn't really like it very much, so migrated all the way to South Africa, and then settled finally in Rhodesia. Mine went out venturing on an Arab Dow in 1893 for four and a half months to five months, and then landed on the shores of Mombasa and started the British Raj in East Africa. So we have something in common. We both trained at the same medical school, and him undergraduate, me postgraduate, but then we met up under different umbrellas in different shady corners of Westminster, and here are together again, dealing with what life is really all about. Beirut, Baghdad, and Basra are ringing through the world ears. Last time we met, it was the dreaded tsunami, David. I hope the third time we meet, it will be golden age, the rate at which it is going. David himself had a lot of experience of Beirut situation here in London at the time of the IRA explosions. And he is by profession a renowned surgeon, an eminent surgeon, who has won more awards than the University of London had in its catalogue to give out. <coughs> to know David's stature, since he's a globetrotter like Daddy, 
and he's always venturing into different theatres. And the beneficiaries are always there to praise his worth decades later. And we know here that Daddy too was one of his worthy patients that benefited from his skill, operation which should have lasted no more than perhaps 15 to 20 minutes, went in for three and a half hours because Daddy had collected a lot of pathological treasures and they had all to be removed at the same time. But David did it so calmly that at that time it struck me, this man will have to be weighed one day and that day has come. Very calm, totally committed, totally focused, giving love at the time of dissecting not just to the organs, but every now and again looking at the patient's head to make sure the anesthetist is performing as he would wish. And really, what a marvelous demonstration of skillful, compassionate surgery, surgical hands. I'm going to put his modesty a little bit in the background and say to him, David, you are the right hand of the true compassionate spiritual surgeon. You have earned that. You have invested your entire energies throughout your career into making those hands, those eyes, that speech, and those ears conduits of worthwhile communication, understanding communication, loving communication, and to impart dispassionately perhaps the total care that anyone could receive. I want to go over his curriculum vitae in a reverse way and just show you what sort of things he's been up to. You know they say if you want to know someone, you have to get inside their heart and explore. Well, I did that with Daddy and Ulrich with me. We got in several times and we know what's in her heart. She can't keep any secrets from us. But to know a surgeon, you have to delve into his mind which is always guarded. So what speaks for the mind is usually what the surgeon writes about. And I'm going to read out a few things that David's been writing about. And I'm sure he's not expecting this to be divulged at this meeting. But since the privilege is mine, and I may not get another opportunity, I'm going to do it. And somehow, Daddy's always been lagging behind in her globe trotting. Where David's been a decade previously, Daddy follows. And what I'm trying to do now is to get these two surgeons, spiritual versus non-spiritual, to travel together so they have lots of exchanges on the plane. Instead of the 10 minutes here or five minutes there or one hour which is regarded as a proper battleground of minds, they can have a lot more companionship. The scientific tour of China and Hong Kong way back in the 90s, early 90s, that is just come back from China after a brief visit and met the scientific medical community there. And the Janki Foundation has gone out and met, I think, 2,000 Chinese doctors. Laparoscopic 
cholecystectomy, our first 300 cases. That's way back in 92. July 24th, 2006. July 24th, 1998, I picked up the phone and rang David. Are you interested in looking at a gallbladder? A well-preserved gallbladder? And he said, certainly yes. But there was a little problem about the heart and one or two other things which had to be sorted out. 24th of August, 1998, David operated on Daddy. In that month, a lot was sorted out, which has given her not just one, second, third, perhaps the fourth lease of life. And I think she's not going to need any more. And as David commented just now, she's getting younger. By jolly, she's getting younger by the day. And I can vouch for it. In fact, I often feel that we are all being cheated. This is not one of our species really on this planet. Way back, perhaps, a craft landed in Sindh from outer space and deposited this one amongst humanity. And she's made of different stuff. She behaves in a totally different way. She's mastered everything that this planet can throw her away. We're never going to know who she is, what she's made of, where she came from. So much power, unlike a human being. And David, you will have to operate yet again to know whether she's one of us or not. David's work spans the whole field of surgery. For the professors, for the trainers, for the students, for the researchers, all the lectures that the top surgeons can give anywhere in the world, David has done. From New York, across to San Francisco, London, Europe, St. Petersburg, China, South Africa, Cairo, Australia, New Zealand, you name it, just like Daddy, he's been everywhere. He lands, he gives a lecture, off he goes. Or he lands, he does his, his little chore, whatever he has to do, such as operate on the Mufti in Cairo and then go away. He's constantly occupied, focused, giving what he's best able to give. The compassion that David has, the healing compassion that he has, I have yet to see in any professional in any part of the world. David, I know you're blushing, but it really comes from a mind that even has to write about pre-operative scrubbing. What a waste of water. Now we are dealing with, at the present time, on water ban, hose pipe ban, we have to conserve water. And there is David, way back in um, 2003, saying, why waste water in the surgical theater? Conserve it. What a waste of water. Even such simple things don't go outside his attention. He knows the whole of the surgical world from A to Z and focuses his mind so that the surgeons, students, professors, teachers, teachers of teachers, all understand what the profession is about. <clears throat> Communicating with the patient, understanding his problem, winning his confidence and love, and giving it not just one fold back, but multifold back, and remembers the details of surgery, each surgery, years later. <clears throat> 